everyone, this is Cindy Dodge from Member Information Services. I'm here today to present a webinar to you or for you on working from home and paying employees, whether they're working from home or they're just at home due to some of the emergency orders that we have recently received, as well as some federal laws that have been passed that protect employees' pay. So, I know that many of you listened to Mike and Catherine's uh, video last week on holding virtual meetings. Holding virtual meetings is a part of employees potentially working from home. Um, and you have likely uh, uh, either shut your township offices or are working under minimal um, uh, circumstances with min minimal staff. And so today, um, I hope to help you figure out, well, then how do we pay those employees as we go? I've broken this presentation into four segments. The first one is working remotely, some ideas about that. The next one is Family First Response Act, which is a new federal law that does require you to pay the employees for up to two weeks if you're requiring them to stay home as part of the quarantine. And then we have the Emergency Family Medical Leave Act, which, um, may allow some of your employees to have an extended leave of absence for additional 10 weeks with pay. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about other payroll issues, including unemployment. So with that, I do wanna put out a disclaimer that member information services can only provide information to the best of our knowledge based on the laws and the statutes of the state and the federal government. We are not your township legal counsel. Therefore, especially if you have a union agreement, that union agreement could be impacting um, how your employees will be paid when they're working from home or when they're home and not working under this emergency situation. So you'll wanna check that agreement and you will wanna work with your uh, township legal counsel to see how those agreements and or any other policies might impact um, the payment of or pay for your employees when they are working from home. Then lastly, I do want to mention that we have the Executive Order 21 um, that is good through April 13. Uh, this Executive Order uh, tells us uh, what we're supposed to be doing right now in terms of employment, who should be working, who should not be working, I do expect or potentially that um, executive order could get expanded past April 13th. We do have a COVID-19 webpage that you'll wanna keep updated on because if there is any change in that date, uh, we will put that out to our members as soon as possible. So in that executive order, it says all in-person government activities at whatever level, state, county, local, that are not necessary to sustain life um, or to support those businesses and operations that are not necessary to protect life are suspended. So in general, most of your employees should be staying home unless they are considered an essential worker. So I'm not really talking here about um, the township board members. Township board members are elected officials, therefore they are essential employees and the government does need to continue forward. So you are definitely considered um, an essential worker. I'm talking about um, those office assistants, those code enforcers, those um, water and sewer, sewer billing assistants, uh, maybe you have people that work out in your parks and recreation or do lawn maintenance in your cemetery. Those are the type of workers I'm talking about today. So things like payroll, emergency services, water operations, transfer stations, uh, making sure that your elections are moving forward, those types of services would be considered uh, essential services and those employees either need to be working from home, working on site, or possibly um, working in limited staggered shifts. So if you have questions about who is an essential worker, again, we have more information on that on our website, and or you're gonna want to um, check with your local legal counsel to uh, work those kinds of details out because MTA cannot tell you 
specifically who should be working or who should not be. That is a township board decision based on other agreements, policies, and what your legal counsel might advise. So for those employees that are able to work from home, um, like for example, MTA is working from home right now. We are very fortunate because uh, several weeks ago, we actually put in place some protocols for working from home in case of inclement weather. So when this emergency took place, we were able to move right into those protocols and work from home pretty seamlessly. You may have some of those protocols in place, um, if you don't, uh, I highly encourage you to start working on those right now, either for the remainder of this um, stay at home work order and or possibly for future um, events that may be unforeseen at this time. So some of the things you need to think about when the employee is working from home is telephone access. Obviously, most people have their own personal cell phones now and, and would likely be able to use those. However, your current phone service with your township could be um, a resource that you could use for those employees working from home. You may um, be using a phone service that can call forward or can mirror um, the call coming into the township to uh, an employee's phone uh, so that they can answer and respond to calls as they would under any normal circumstance or day. So, Check out your phone system and see if that's something that you can put in place right now for those employees working from home. The other thing is email. Obviously, email becomes very important when we're working remotely. Um, we here at MTA use uh, Microsoft 365, so we've been able to uh, access our email remotely when whether I'm on the road teaching or um, I'm staying from home on the weekend even, sometimes I check my email. So um, you may already have that type of uh, software in place, which your employees can continue to use while they're working from home and or staying at home. Uh, then if you don't have something like that, maybe they're using their own personal emails, maybe you're using your own personal emails, um, those you can continue to use. I would give you some, um, heads up or warning about uh, cybersecurity concerns right now. Uh, when we are working from home, it tends to give those hackers out there a little bit more uh, leeway or freeway into our personal emails or our personal accounts. So you may wanna check out um, any security issues with um, working remotely in online or through emails. The next thing that is very helpful when you have employees working from home is a way to communicate with them in some type of team meeting. Employees need that um, connection with their boss, uh, one, so they don't feel isolated, but two, so that they're staying on ta task, so you know that they're staying on task, so that everybody knows what everybody is working on and what is the status of um, whether or not they may be able to return from work. So in the initial information that we put out for virtual meetings, you could also use that for team meetings. You could use Zoom, you could use GoToMeetings, um, the Microsoft Suite has a program called Team. We're using Team to chat with each other or to video conference with each other. But there are plenty of platforms out there that you can use to still communicate with your employees in a team type setting while they're out there working. And then next, the other resource that you wanna make sure that they have full access to is computers and the software that they need to do their work. So in our case, we've actually brought our own computers home. I actually brought home my printer because I'm working on a new book and I wanna be able to print things off as I'm doing that. So computers, printers, uh, cables, um, extent, even extension cords, all of the things that people need to sit at their desk, they may be able to move those to their home. So um, the thing about that though is that when they're working from, with their computers from work at home, um, it may be that their computers are um, some type of software that is already installed on the hard drive so they can continue to work um, 
in that method, whether it be water billing or it be assessing or tax, um, uh, QVF, maybe they can enter that uh, remotely online through the QVF system. Um, so in that case, we really don't need to worry about trying to network together or using an outside cloud-based software because it's already on your computers and they can just access it from their computer when they get home. If it's not on their hard drives, if you are using a software that is um, housed out in the cloud or housed with a third party administrator like BSNA, um, then you're gonna need to make sure that they have the ability to connect with um, those servers or those companies. And later, um, towards the end of this program, I will be talking about lawful expenditures as it applies to providing those internet type resources for your employees. But the one example that I can think of, many of you know that I'm into cemeteries and I often get a lot of phone calls about starting new cemetery um, management software. But it's also one of those things that's very work intensive, very tedious, often gets um, pushed to the bottom of the pile. Well, this might be one of those opportune times to actually get that cemetery software up and running when an employee is uninterrupted and can work um, at home uh, updating and implementing that software. So those are ways that they can actually work from home. If you do have those essential services where the employee needs to come into the office and process payroll or take care of any of those other emergency services, then you do really want to consider uh, um, staggering those shifts and setting up other protocols for while, while they're in the office. Uh, MTA has a protocol for if we need to go into the office, first of all, we have to ask permission to go into the office. Nobody's allowed to just come and go as we normally would. Um, and that is because we wanna make sure we know who's there and we wanna make sure that the office is sanitary while somebody's in there and then after they leave for the next person that's coming in. So again, on our COVID-19 webpage, we have put um, uh, uh, our protocol for entering the office up on that web page. You might want to reference that. It talks about um, hand sanitizers, wiping down your workplace, even wiping down the toilet handle when you go to the bathroom before you leave. So these are just things that are in our world here in the next few weeks that we need to think about. And we have those resources for you so you can think about them. Um, okay, so with that, those are some of those ways that those employees might be able to work from home. The last thing I want to say about employees working from home is that unlike some of the other laws I'm actually going to be talking about, Fair Labor Standards Act, um, uh, the Family First Response Act, etc., we also have to be sensitive of all of our discrimination laws. We cannot discriminate at this time in terms of who gets to work from home and who doesn't. It can't be based on, um, you know, well, I like this person better, I trust their work ethic better, I know that they're going to be working on something. It really does need to be based on their job description as well as fair and equitable to everyone and you do not um, violate any uh, discrimination laws or equal employment laws. So keep that in the back of your head because uh, we don't want you to get in trouble with that either at this time. So any employee that is working from home, they are still subject to the Fair Labor Standards Act. So the Fair Labor Standards Act, as you probably know, governs minimum wage and overtime for employees. It also tells us what employees can be non-exempt versus what employees can be exempt. A non-exempt employee is an employee that has to be paid hourly, and if they go over 40 hours in any given week or seven day period, then they have to be paid one and a half times their regular wage for all hours over 40 hours. That is an exempt, a non-exempt employee. An exempt employee are those that fit into several different categories, either they're professional, they're executive, they may be administrative, they may be computer um, oriented or have some other professional 
education that would put them into those exempt categories. There's lots of information on our website uh, to the Fair Labor Standards Act in terms of who is uh, exempt versus non-exempt, um, but um, you, you, whether they're exempt or non-exempt, they do still have to be paid while they are at home. So um, the one issue that I see that will likely impact your ability to determine whether somebody is exempt or non-exempt are those employees that are what we call salaried non-exempt. Salaried non-exempt employees and or project employees. A project employee is someone who is getting paid by the event or by the project. So you may have like a code enforcement officer that gets paid by the complaint, that um, code enforcement officer is what we call a non-exempt employee who is getting paid project pay. So people who are salaried non-exempt, they are ones who um, are getting paid a flat dollar amount likely every month or whatever your regular scheduled payday is. Um, and if they work under 40 hours, they're still getting that salary. But if they go over 40 hours, you do need them to track and log their time so that um, you make sure they are still compliant with minimum wage. So for example, um, let's take that code enforcer. That code enforcer, let's say they're getting paid $50 per complaint. Well, currently minimum wage is $9.45. So that means that that code enforcer can work about 5.3 hours on that complaint at $50 a complaint and still be in compliance with the Fair Labor Standards Act. Same with, um, you can break that back down into like maybe you have an office worker who gets paid um, $200 per month, that non-exempt salary pay. You need them to track their hours so that you can make sure that the number of hours that they work each week do not fall below minimum wage based on that $200 per month. So tracking employees' time while they're at home, even when you're in a regular time and um, they're out working in the field or um, even if they're uh, a non-exempt salaried worker like a receptionist working in your township hall, you need them always to track their time. So when you're not actually paying by hour, it becomes even more important to track their time so that you know that flat dollar amount that you're paying them doesn't fall below minimum wage. If it does, then you have to readjust their wage so that they're at least making minimum wage. So hopefully that's helpful for you in terms of how you pay them when they're at home. If they are at home working in review, you do have to pay them. You do have to be in compliance with the Fair uh, Labor Standards Act, uh, meaning they have to be paid at least minimum wage and paid overtime. Therefore, it's very important that you track their time and you really wanna be careful about tracking those employees who are Again, what we classified as non-exempt salaried employees or project employees making the flat dollar amount once a month. The next thing that we're gonna move into is um, Families First, the Family First Response Act. This act was um, put out by the federal government and it goes into effect April 1st through December 31st, 2020. That's really important because many of you may have already asked your employees to uh, stay at home, not necessarily work at home, but to stay at home um, due to the executive orders and the quarantine and the fact that they are not performing that essential service for the township. So um, between the time that you let them or required them to stay home, that could have been starting, you know, uh, mid-March through the end of March, um, unless they have some kind of personal PTO time or you are subject to using the Michigan paid sick leave time, which we will review here in a minute. Um, 
uh, they likely were not getting paid during those two or three weeks. Effective April 1st, however, that all employees will be subject to this act regardless of uh, township size. The act actually does address uh, employers 500 employees or less. I'm assuming most of our townships have less than 500 employees. Um, so uh, we're gonna move forward with that. If by chance you happen to be over uh, 500 employees, again, you're gonna wanna work with your legal counsel on how to pay those employees while they're off. So um, this applies to uh, anyone who has been required to stay home uh, due to the COVID-19 mandate and those executive orders. Um, it is um, also applies to any employee that has been advised to stay home by a health care provider or to self-quarantine by a health care provider. This could be those employees who have um, compromised immune system or other underlying symptoms, uh, which requires them to stay home. So it's not just that the township is asking them to stay home, but a health care provider is also asking them to self-quarantine. Obviously, any employee that is experiencing a coronavirus type symptom or is seeking current medical attention for um, the coronavirus strains um, should also or must also stay home. And then other employees who may be experiencing um, substantially similar um, symptoms as we would see with the COVID-19 or other coronavirus um, symptoms. They also are going to need to stay home. The last category of employees that are protected under this act are those who are staying home to care for a child because their daycare has closed and or their daycare is unavailable. So for example, maybe some of your employees take their um, uh, uh, children to an in-home daycare and those in-home daycare providers are no longer going to provide that in-home care. Um, those would be people uh, that would be eligible for um, benefits under the Family First Act. And then those big commercial daycares that may have closed due to the executive order. The one in the, not only are those essential workers that we talked about earlier um, uh, exempt from the um, Family First Act, but all healthcare providers and emergency responders are exempt from this act too. So if you are requiring your firefighters, your police department, your ambulance uh, providers or staff, they are all likely going to have to continue to work or to work on a limited basis based on the needs in your community. So how do we pay or what is the benefit for those who, let's say you have just required them to stay home and to self-quarantine? Not because a health provider, although those could be the reasons, um, have to stay home, but they're just staying home due to this um, executive order mandates. Anyone who is considered a full-time employee, they are to receive 80 hours of sick leave. So essentially, the first two weeks of leave after April 1st, anyone who is a full-time employee who meets those criteria would be eligible for the regular pay, uh, whether that's salaried pay or um, hourly paid, non-exempt um, salaried or project pay. Uh, Generally, those that are non-exempt salary or project pay are gonna fall under what we call part-time workers. Uh, they're not working typically a total of 40 hours per week. So anyone who's not full-time, um, project workers, as well as um, non-exempt salaries who don't work part-time, or hourlies that work part-time, they are also eligible for up to two weeks of sick leave beginning April 1st based on their wage and their average hours. So what are their average hours over the last couple of weeks uh, before they went on leave? That would be the wage that you would need to pay them and or at least minimum wage. So um, you can, um, if, you, if you can't determine that because maybe they've already been on a leave prior to this, 
um, or had a, a lightened workload just before this all happened, you can go back and do a, like a six month analysis of their average weekly rate wage. And based on that six month analysis, then you could calculate an hourly rate or a weekly wage for them. So full time, 80 hours, uh, sick time, part time, project work and non-exempt salary based on their regular hours over an average of two weeks is what they would need to be paid. Now, there is a cap on that, however, uh, for that two weeks. Um, employees um, uh, wage is capped at $511 per day or $5,110 uh, in the aggregate for the full two weeks. So, um, if you have employees that exceed those uh, minimum thresholds or those maximum thresholds, I should say, um, that is capped for the employer. You would not need to pay any more than that in those two weeks. Now, um, for employees that um, are just staying home because they're not required to be quarantined, like you would like them to be in the office to work, um, and they don't have their own health issues that they're taking care of, or uh, they don't have that family daycare that has um, caused them to have to stay home, but they are just home taking care of another family member. This could be their spouse, it could be a mother, it could be, um, it, you know, other family members that they're having to take care of those employees, they're eligible for two-thirds of their normal wage, and that is also capped at $200 per day, up to $2,000 in the aggregate for the whole two weeks. So um, if you're requiring them to uh, stay home and stay quarantined, then we're under the normal wage. But if you're not requiring them to be quarantined and they're staying home to take care of a family member, then they're eligible for two thirds of their wage. So with that, the other thing that this act does require us um, is to put up noticing. Um, there is a workplace poster that must go along with this act. It has been issued, it is linked to our COVID-19 webpage. So you can go out there, you don't need to buy one officially through those companies. You can just print it off from the federal link that we've put on our website and you can post it. Now, there is the question of, okay, so we've posted it, but we don't have any employees in our office to you know, see what their rights are. So for example, with MTA, um, our executive director, when those posters came out, he actually emailed those to each one of us so that um, we knew what our rights were. So you might want to consider that too, is to email that poster to each one of your employees now that it is, um, it is available. The last thing I want to say on the um, Family First Response Act, and I'm making this in bold and in capitalize, after April 1st, an employee an employer cannot require a worker to use any other available leave before using the sick time as provided in this act. So if they have their own PTO time or their own vacation time, um, or maybe uh, time under the Michigan Paid Sick Leave Act, they do not have to use that in the first two weeks. In the first two weeks, they are using the time allowed through the Family First Response Act. Okay, so now we've gotten through the first two weeks. Now we're gonna move on to the remainder 10 weeks that potentially an employee could apply to be off from under the Emergency Family Medical Leave Act. This act is somewhat different than our traditional Family Medical Leave Act. As you may already know, and this will just be a quick review, all public employers are subject to the Family Medical Leave Act. However, not all employees are subject to the Family Medical Leave Act. So in order for an employee to be subject to the Family Medical Leave Act, they must work at a work site in which there are at least 50 full-time employees um, that requires um, them to receive those protections under the Family Medical Leave Act. 
A lot of our townships that are smaller, even though they have to comply to FMLA, their employee would not be eligible for FMLA because they don't meet that in 50 um, employee threshold. Those of you that are a little bit larger, you're likely already implementing the FMLA. You probably have forms and procedures and policies in place for employees applying for FMLA. Um, but that's not really what we're talking about here because the Emergency Family Medical Leave Act is overruling the FMLA Act in that um, if the employee qualifies for the emergency FMLA, then um, they are eligible for up to 10 more weeks of leave. That's what we're going to talk about now. So in order to be eligible for the emergency FMLA, they have to have worked for the township for 30 days. This is different than the Family First Response Act. In order to get those first two weeks of sick leave paid, it doesn't matter how long they've worked for the township. They could have worked for the township for one day, two days, five days, and they are eligible for those two weeks of emergency sick leave pay. With the emergency FMLA, in order to be eligible for that, they would have had to have worked for you for at least 30 days. And if they've worked for you for 30 days, there are limited reasons why they would be eligible for emergency FMLA. Those emergency reasons are that they are caring for a minor child if the child's school or place of care has been closed, or if that child care provider of that child is unavailable due to the coronavirus emergency. Similar to what we just saw up in the um, emergency paid sick leave. So if they are staying home due to their own health condition, uh, they've contracted the coronavirus, they've been advised to stay home, um, then those townships that are um, required to be in compliance with FMLA, those employees could apply for additional leave under FMLA and whatever your policy is for that in terms of pay, no pay, benefits, obviously would continue under that act as mandated. So this emergency FMLA only applies to workers or employees who need to stay home because of childcare reasons. If they do, then they get an additional 10 weeks of leave and that leave will be paid at two-thirds the employee's regular rate of pay. So um, we do have information on our COVID-19 website um, that gives like a Q&A from the Department of Labor how this will work. I've also linked up some um, links to uh, the federal government's FMLA website in case you need forms. Um, or any kind of other uh, work release orders from their doctors, et cetera, to be in compliance with this act. So let's just review this a little bit more. Effective April 1st, an employee who qualifies for the paid sick leave, they're required to stay at home because you want them to stay home and they're not going to be working from home. They are allowed to have up to the two weeks paid sick leave. After those two weeks, if they need to stay home because of childcare purposes, then they are eligible for the emergency FMLA and they will be allowed to be paid up to two thirds of their wage. So, um, and again, those who do not qualify because of that um, child care provision, but they need to stay home because of their own health condition or taking care of a family member because they are quarantined, uh, they can possibly be eligible for your current FMLA uh, leave if that is something you're required to provide um, or uh, other PTO, um, uh, policies that you might have in place. 
So the next thing is, okay, so now there's kind of like this gap of employees that don't fit into those categories. So what about their pay? We're past the two weeks now, what about their pay? There's a couple of things I've mentioned several times. First of all, you might have a policy in place where there are accruing vacation time, what we call PTO time and or sick time. They could start using that time to be at home or if you are uh, required to be in compliance with the Emer or Michigan um, Medical Paid Leave Act, they could be using that time. The Michigan Paid Medical Leave Act went into effect uh, last year, March 31st, 2019, and basically it is any township that is over 50 employees have to allow those employees to accrue up to 40 hours of sick leave. So if you uh, need to be in compliance with that and your employees have been accruing that time over the past year, they could potentially use that time um, after the two weeks of uh, paid leave through the Family First Act. Um, and then if they don't have that, you don't have any leave time that they could take, then the, the next option is for them to file for unemployment. So um, as you may know, again, on our COVID-19 website, we have posted up information about unemployment, the governor's executive order that has um, expanded the unemployment eligibility. So um, my understanding, just from personal references that I have that are applying for unemployment, when, they, when the employee actually goes out and applies for the unemployment, there is now a separate tab for COVID-19 that they should click on, which basically means their employer is requiring them to stay home as part of the executive order. And so what we would normally see as the requirements for unemployment are now being expanded and they likely are gonna be eligible for unemployment due to that governor's executive order. So um, those employees will uh, file for unemployment. Uh, the townships generally are reimbursing employers, so they will um, get notice that that employee has filed for unemployment, um, and it will be based off of the reports that you have filed on their wages. Uh, all townships are required to um, uh, file quarterly wage reports on those employees who are subject to unemployment. If you don't know what employees are subject to unemployment, uh, again, we have a resource on our website. This is on the member side under um, the Answer Center resource toolkits and it's called Understanding um, Unemployment. There we list out who needs to re be reported and who doesn't. So those that would be eligible for unemployment will probably most likely automatically be eligible because of this new executive order. So um, how do we pay employees when they're off? Well, it's no different than how we paid them when they were working. Um, <laughs> so uh, there is the Michigan Payment of Wages that governs how employees are paid. They have to be paid at least every 30 days. You can pay them weekly, you can pay them bi-weekly, you can pay them semi-monthly, but no more than every 30 days. Uh, you can pay them by check. If you get their written permission, you can pay them by direct deposit, or there is this new opportunity now where they're called employee payroll debit cards, where instead of issuing a check, you've actually given your employee a debit card, and each time you process payroll, you load it onto the debit card. In that situation, you do not have to get the employee's permission to do that. Um, you do have the authority to just move forward with debit cards, but if you want to just do direct deposit, then you do have to get the employee's written permission to do direct deposit. Obviously, when we're working remotely, um, using direct deposit or payroll debit cards are going to be the most efficient. Um, we've taken several phone calls already about you know, well, how do we get the paychecks to the employees? There's even been some concern 
um, regarding passing the virus through the paper. And I'm not even going to weigh in on that. All I'm telling you is that employees need to be paid at least every 30 days. Nothing changes with um, our current emergency orders in terms of paying our employees when they're eligible to be paid. So reimbursing employees. This is the last thing that I want to talk about. What might be considered um, uh, lawful reimbursement expenses. Any type of reimbursement is a benefit. So employers are required to reimburse employees for um, business expenses. However, most of you do. I'm even going to suggest most of you should do that, especially in times like this where there are already other financial burdens on the employee. Uh, any way that you can help assist them um, in a lawful way uh, is going to uh, build good morale so that when we do all get back together, people aren't you know, frustrated about what happened while they were off of work. So um, let's say that you want to reimburse your employee for their internet, or let's say your employee is now having to go from their home to the bank to make deposits or something along that lines. Mileage is a benefit and it is reimbursable. Um, if it's reimbursed at the IRS rate, then um, that does not affect their gross wages. And that is really um, all a part of what we call an accountable plan versus a non-accountable plan. So if the employee is going to get reimbursed for a business expense, if they turn in a bill for that expense, like their internet bill or, um, or some other documentation for that expense, that is called an, an accountable plan and they just can be reimbursed for that and it does not impact their gross wages. If you're just going to give your employees a flat rate for those business expenses, like let's say, okay, well, we're gonna give you an additional $50 a month um, for internet costs, uh, telephone costs, um, maybe you have to buy um, something for their printer, like paper, anything like that, all of those different business expenses. Um, and you give them a flat dollar for dollar amount for them, that is a non-accountable plan and that is considered wage to the employee. So that would go into their gross wage um, for any reimbursement on those expenses if it doesn't have to be accounted for through some kind of receiving process where you're paying specifically for the receipt that they've turned in. So um, with that, um, I'm sure I haven't covered everything. Uh, this is a big subject. It can often be very technical in nature. Uh, many of you know that I'm happy to help you with those questions. Uh, member information services, obviously, we're up and operating. We're there from eight to five, Monday through Friday. You can email us, you can phone call us. Myself, Catherine, or Mike will be able to help you. And uh, with that, I want to just say stay safe, be healthy, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.